Thank you for coming tonight. Our title, Why Thinking Christians Should Become Platonists. Now there's a interesting work I'd like you to know about. And this is a series of works that are studies in Neoplatonism. It's about five volumes now. And there's a volume called Neoplatonism and Christian Thought. The last article is by a very interesting philosopher by the name of John Findlay, F-I-N-D-L-A-Y. His article is Why Christians Should Be Platonists. Now he takes it from the philosophical and he explores it ontologically. And he does a very interesting comparison, taking it in terms of its metaphysics. However, I'm not doing that. I'm taking it from a different viewpoint, which is why I believe thinking Christians should become Platonists. And our journey is going to be primarily a reflection on the texts of the New Testament and bringing together some most interesting research that has been going on. Now, what do I mean by thinking Christians and Platonists? Well, luckily enough, we can take that down. And with my contraption I made, since our pad wasn't available for this evening, by a thinking Christian, I mean one who can follow the studies and research on biblical studies and whose concern is to establish their views and beliefs in early Christian texts. That's what I mean by a thinking Christian. All right? Someone who's concerned about the texts and wants to see the basic beliefs or faith rooted in Christian texts, not in the ensuing metaphysical struggles that came out of that and as the church defined Christianity. This is a text work. Now, that means, therefore, there's a need to locate the central message, sometimes called the kerygma, of Christianity. Sometimes that's called the hermeneutical task, and hermeneutical is just a fancy word for the art of interpreting, the interpretations involved in the task of finding a central message. By a Platonist, I mean one who can follow the studies and the dialogues of Plato and the Platonic tradition to establish their views and practices for their own benefit primarily, which is a spiritual benefit. There is no difference in the spiritual dimension of either. So with that, just in terms of how to define it, and if there's any question as we're going along that you'd like to ask, please be free to just jump in and do so. Uh, normally I would just flip these charts over. Now, there is a traditional and inherited view. Now, the, the essential thing to keep in mind is that Christianity developed until the 17th century. Historically, it defined, it went through many, many processes to define the core beliefs of Christianity. That was without a critical examination of the texts, because it was defined by the Pope and church councils. Now, 17th or some part 16th century for Luther, but essentially the 17th century for English speaking people, out came the text. So therefore something new enters into the intellectual universe and spiritual universe, and that's the text. It was assumed by many people, and it may still be assumed by some today, that there should be no difference between that development of Christianity historically and what can be found in the texts. The shock that many people encounter in studying Christian texts and trying to base their beliefs on the text is that that is not true. Which is nothing surprising since historical processes define one thing, text and text analysis often defines another. The traditional inherited view 
is that you can root your basic beliefs in Paul and John, writings of St. Paul and St. John as they call them, and then Luke, Acts, then Matthew and Mark was an abbreviation of these, and the revelations and the letters could be supporting elements. Now, some very interesting research was done, and I have a whole list of the scholars who have done it, but I'm going to drop out their names for a while. And the first major work, apart from uh, John Locke, John Locke uh, did an early study on Christianity, and the whole purpose of it was to show the rationalism of Christianity. And by rationalism, he meant minimizing or ignoring or deflating the role of miracles. By the way, Thomas Jefferson did something very similar. Thomas Jefferson has a little uh, Bible that only has the sayings of Jesus, and that way he dropped out the whole problem of miracles. Now, then some interesting people started doing some very interesting reading, and scholarship is just close, calculated reasoning and using the mind to understand important texts. The first real breakthrough came and some scholars said, you know what's going on? This is not accurate. What's really going on is that these three together, and then over here is John, these three together have something very close in common. And that allows us to talk about the synopsis, those brought together. And early it was called Matthew, they thought, Luke, and last of all, in time was Mark. Then the next wave of scholarship came. It didn't take long, about 30 years actually. And this thesis was re-examined. And they said, no, 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 that's not quite the case. And by a very interesting argument, they showed that Mark was first. And Matthew was second. And Luke was third. Well, what difference does it make? Which comes first and which second? Let's see if I can add something to this. You see, Matthew has uh, what is a sayings of Jesus. He has miracles. He has prophetic utterances, or uh, passion material as it's called, and post-resurrection scenes. Right. He has sayings of Jesus, he has miracles, he has the passion material. By passion material this evening I mean the arrest, the trial, and the crucifixion. There is also something else. There's also a large section of parables. Now, if Matthew is first, then we can study Matthew as a way of gaining an, an idea of Jesus, especially in terms of his history, since there's a whole prologue in Matthew dealing with the historical study of Jesus. Well, you see, let's go right across here and make a few points. Luke, same, 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 same. Mark, zero. Miracles, passion. No post-resurrection stories, parables, no historical. Now when I say no post-resurrection theme, I am getting ahead of myself, but let me tell you why. We are going to go into the significance of the Codex Sinaiticus, and the Codex Sinaiticus is the early New Testament that was discovered in St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai, and there are other codexes which have the similar structure, including the Codex Vaticanitis and the Syria uh, Atticus as well. And these th agree that Mark ends at 16.8. 
and the last 12 verses were added and they have a very good idea when they were added and who added them and I can get into that later. It's on that basis that I say there's no, I say, many people obviously <laughs> say when I say I, it's only editorial. All right? Now look here, what does that mean? You see, if Mark, as Matthew was first, then you can say Mark is merely an abridgment. A shorthand copy. Then you don't have to worry about the fact that these are missing, one, two, three. But if you say Mark is first, now you have a new question, don't you? It's like, good heavens, why doesn't Mark have the sayings of Jesus? He does have the miracles, he has the passion. Why doesn't he have the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus? And he doesn't contribute much to this whole historical question. Therefore, a whole new question comes up. See, the force of the research, the force of careful reading makes this an issue if it's first. If it's not first, then we can just simply say when, they, when Mark copied and abbreviated Matthew, he just left those things out and it doesn't make any difference. Then we can just discover his reasons for it and there's no issue. But to the degree that it can be asserted that Mark is first, then we have to deal with this issue. Now therefore, a new thesis came in, if Mark is first. If Mark is first, then there must be something very interesting going on. And that is that the sayings of Jesus, and I'm going to call that for shorthand, Q. All right? The sayings of Jesus are Q is missing from Mark. Hmm. Therefore, Matthew and Luke must both have found a way to gain that kind of material, but Mark did not. Equally well, it looks like they both copied Mark. Well, Matthew has 90% as you know of Mark, and Luke has about 55% of Mark. And that means they follow the word order, the grammar is similar, uh, though Luke is more sophisticated. And wherever Matthew and Luke proceed in their writing, they always follow the order established in the writing of Mark. And therefore, uh, Luke, Luke really depends upon Mark as Matthew depends upon Mark. And you can also make the following point, and that is that uh, Luke borrowed material from Luke, and therefore it really is an interesting question that to create this gospel of Matthew and Luke, they used Q as well as our good friend Mark. That's called the two-document thesis. Called two-document thesis. Now, a very interesting scholar did some very interesting work. He looked at Q and he said, you know what, if you examine the sayings of Jesus, the way in which Luke uses Q shows a very close appreciation for the way the ideas in Q's are developed. Uh-oh, then Luke depends upon Q as well as Mark. Oh, then he's doing something with Q. He's allowing it to order in with the way in which he's composing the gospel. You see, now we can date it. And now, uh, let me put in, by the way, there is no general agreement as to the dates. It's minus and plus, depending upon who you read, two to five years. 70, 80, or 82, and 84, or something like that. And these dates are constantly being revised for a good reason. Everything I say tonight is based upon arguments. All of these are arguments. Could you make a point about how it was shown that Luke depended upon Q again? I didn't follow the reasoning of why Luke Well, depends. Luke depends upon Q. Now, we have to talk about Q to make that point. But Q is in three levels. And you have to see that if it's in three levels, it develops historically from the first, second, to the third. And uh, uh, I, I can make that point a little later when we get into Q. But that, in other words, it's an argument based upon the way in which Q is organized. 
All right. Now, scholars began to saying to themselves, look here. We're trying to find the central message of Jesus. And Q has the possible date. Now, they did a lot of arguing for this. And they came up with this very interesting possible date of 50. Now, over here, I'm going to write the problem of Paul. Okay, I'm just going to call it a problem. Pardon me? Yes, 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 for, for many people. Right. Well, while they were about to get into Q, scholars then, in a way, were shifted because of a major argument by two scholars, and um, actually three to come together. But let me talk about what's happening. Some people said, look here, Q is not the problem. The Gospels are not the problem. The real problem is you have to anchor your faith in Paul. That's the problem. And if you anchor your faith in Paul, then there's a kinship. The closest kinship is between Paul and John. There's a kinship in terms of to what degree the Gospel authors are picking up what Paul is saying. But notice the dates. Paul dies at approximately 57 A.D. Mark, you can say, literally ignores what is being said by Paul nearly in its entirety as Paul ignores the, ministry, the earthly ministry of Jesus as he says himself. Now, this sometimes is called the problem of the 14 points. Now, I'd like to get into that, but first I'd like to go to another point, and that is when you look at Mark and you look at the study of Mark, you notice something extremely interesting. You can take Mark in increments, each one of the episodes, and you can say, see that there is an incremental development in the entire work you can take Mark and nearly literally cut it in half. There are only 667 verses, and if you cut it right in half, if you exclude the 12 verses, you attack that from 667, right, and that gives you 52, right. Uh, every story increases the level of the story in respect to the, the, the enormity of the miracles, uh, of the impact it has on people around him, and therefore, his fame grows and grows as the miracles increase in importance. His fame grows. Then there's a central issue here. And from that central issue, there proceeds a greater and greater degree of danger until it finally culminates in the crucifixion. Now, not only can you take each one of these scenes incrementally, but you can take whole chapters of them, like eight, seven, and six are together interrelated on a very high level. This is called Mark's linkage. Mark's linkage, that's what it's called. That it looks like it is so carefully designed that another thinker, who I was not going to mention names until the end, but I, I really think this man that deserves a, a special applause, Hengel by name, Hengel came along and said, look here, if you take this structure and break it up into five nice pieces, you can see, now this excludes the idea of the post-resurrection Jesus. Remember, with the 16.8, no post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. If you drop out, if you drop out, you see, the post-resurrection appearances, then you have to look at this story and look for its meaning somewhere else than in the post-resurrection thesis. Well, there is no place in the Gospel of Mark where any man mentions Jesus as the Son of God. Now, the Son of God. The centurion at the end of the story recognizes the figure of Jesus, and he says, not a, but, not the, but a Son of God. It's not the. In the beginning of Mark, 
this is the beginning, of the, you know, it's the Gospel of Mark, starts with the thesis that uh, the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That announcement came later, uh, somewhere around 600, I believe. And uh, this was added in the beginning of the story. Therefore, there's a profound mystery about what's going on with this fantastic figure called Jesus. Now, why do we say fantastic? Because there's an interesting position in the middle of this story, and that's that great scene of the transfiguration. Right? The transfiguration is that divine luminosity that spills all over Jesus in front of Peter and, and uh, uh, John. Uh, it's, and out of the luminosity emerges Elijah and Moses, and they have a talk together. An astonishing story, of course, where Peter says, after he sees that, we should build three tabernacles. And, uh, of course, Jesus tells him, oh, hold off, you, uh, wait until you understand something. And that is, what does it mean for the Son of Man to be risen in three days? And they worry about that, and they say, what in heaven's name does he mean? But uh, this, this is the great drama, see? Right in the middle of the story is the transfiguration. There is no resolution of what he is in the story. Therefore, these divisions and the drama that unfolds bears a one-to-one -one correspondence to a Greek tragedy as defined by Aristotle. It has the five parts of a tragedy. It has a one-to-one -one correspondence. And therefore, what does that mean? That means it was constructed as a literary work. Therefore, you can't use it as a basis for historical study of Jesus. Or it must be subordinated. Now, let me see if we can go into the 14 points, just for a moment. Okay, this is the traditional view, and every one of these quotes can be found in Paul, and it's called the 14 points. That, all right. This is the traditional view that was given the picture of Christianity that existed prior to biblical studies. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'll hold it down when I need it. Thank you. That God sent forth his son, a pre-existent divine being, who appears as a man on earth, he dies the death of a sinner. He makes atonement for the sins of man. The resurrection marks the beginning of a cosmic catastrophe. Death, the consequence of Adam's sin, is abolished. The demonic forces are deprived of their power. And the risen Christ is at the right hand of God. He will come again on the clouds of heaven. And redemption, resurrection, and judgment, and death, all of that will be abolished. And it will happen soon in the life of Paul, he thinks, and in Mark. It is imminent. Now, every one of these 14 points can only be found in Paul. They cannot be found in Mark. They cannot be found in Matt. One or two possible interpretations will fit in Luke, but some more, by far, are found in John. Now, what does that mean? Well, just to have it in the moment, simply said, it means that Mark ignored Paul and these points. He knew the sayings of Q, ignored them. He was doing something else. And what he was doing is doing a study on these two, parables, miracles. That's the force of Mark. Now, why that is interesting is uh, Boltman and C.H. Dodd, who's the famous Greek scholar who did the great work on the elements of theology uh, of Proclus, and that's still going on, it reached its high point around 1970, 1980. They have then taken upon themselves to do a major study of the parables to see whether they can crack the meaning of the parables. And this is a very interesting work. What they found so far, they brought together a good number of them. And 
Uh, the ba basic thesis that's being developed now is all of the parables together point to the need for and the exploration of the one idea, the kingdom of God. And the miracles are playing a background role which are, which are playing an emphasis in respect to the kingdom of God and therefore that's the whole thesis that's carrying across with Mark. Now, the significance of the parables for Mark is that he's very clear, Mark is very clear about the parables, that they are for the twelve and those that are with him and those that are with Jesus, that's what he says, and those that are with, with him, with me. All right, that's what they're for. Now, that makes it an esoteric teaching because he says, and for the others, uh, I will speak only in parables, but for you I will tell you and reveal to you the meaning of the parables. Therefore, it's an esoteric story. The sayings of Jesus only have, at the most, just a, two uh, parables, but they're opened up and explored. They are not kept secret. Therefore, in the hands of Mark, we're getting an esoteric teaching that fits in with the background of Greek tragedy that seems to have many themes and ideas common to the Hellenistic age. Now, uh, do I want to go there yet? No, not yet. Okay. Now, two men were very, are playing a major role. One is called Kloppenberg, and uh, the other one is Robinson from Claremont down here in, in uh, the Institute of Antiquities. What have they done? You see, what's happened is we now have a wealth of material that was unknown, and we're all familiar with it. Basically, it's the material that was known uh, and discovered by, um, oh, I forget his name. Oh, um, oh, I'll think about it. Uh, and St. Catherine's Monastery in 1870, uh, he came out with a text in 1879. Oh, let me get my chalk and put down a couple of things, all right? Thomas Taylor? Pardon me? Thomas Taylor? No, no, no. Was that great genius? Uh, um, it's right on the tip of my fingers. No, no. He went in and he literally stole it from the monks and he brought it to the czar and uh, this beautiful copy of the earliest uh, Bible. And he did a major analysis of the text and he published three volumes and one of the volumes is a close examination of the text which he made. And by the way, he found 13,800 differences discrepancies between that existing Bible and, and uh, uh, the current Bible. What? Starts with a W? No, Tischendorf. Oh, starts with a T. Right on the tip of Yeah, well, Tischendorf is a, a, an astonishing figure. Uh, Self-taught, and that's a very often, it's very significant. Well, at St. Catharines, you see, when they opened up and they discovered this ancient work, third, that is 350, 340, they think 340 is the most likely date or just after 340, they found many things. One of the things they found is there has been a quest for trying to get the earliest possible text in order to get the most reliable text to get to a period when the text was originally established and uh, therefore, they can then base their teachings and their insights and their development of Christian thought from the most reliable text. This text, which is 340, I had a beautifully uh, uh, preserved document, has some very interesting things about it. One of the most interesting things about it is that as you look at the text itself, here is the text. And alongside the pages often are three dots. And three dots signify that the person who was copying it, the person who was copying it, thought that that particular line or part of it should be deleted. 
and there are also marginal notes where they think something should be added. So therefore already at 340 there was already an accepted tradition of still working on the text and therefore the dream about getting back the most early text that wouldn't be contaminated doesn't appear to be consistent with the way in which they were trying to develop the text in the first place. But there are a lot of amazing, uh, beautiful things and important things about the uh, text and there's a beautiful book and I have some Xerox copies of key passages for you which when you leave I'd like you to get a copy of. But um, this allows us then to say to ourselves, look here, Everyone is trying to take this idea of Christianity, the traditional view, and see whether they can verify it in the text. It's like reading everything backwards. You can look at the New Testament through the eyes of Paul, and you're going to come out of Paul in. You're going to look at the eyes, you're going to look at Christianity through the eyes of John and Paul or John, you're going to again interpret it that way. Now, What's happening with the most interesting work going on now is there's a radical shift. And the radical shift in research is, no, no, no. Start with Q. That's the earliest. Separate it entirely from all the other works. Do all your homework on Q and see then how Q changes as it goes through the texts. Now, what does that do? That does many, many interesting and amazing things. The first is that if you look at Q, you then see something quite interesting, and that is there's something very interesting about Q because when they found the great Nag Hammadi library at that third cataract along the Nile, an old ancient Christian monastery was there, and then abandoned, but it appeared around the fourth century. At the time, 367 is the usual date given for it. There was a great purge of non-Orthodox Christian texts, and so they destroyed the whole libraries of Gnostic works. But in the Nag Hammadi library, they found 54 volumes. And included, including, by the way, is the part of the sixth book of Plato's Republic which I often enjoy thinking about. Among the 54 volumes is a very beautiful gospel called the Gospel of Thomas. By the way, Gospel of Thomas. Uh, put another figure here, Mark. Thomas. Thirty-five percent of the Gospel of Thomas is Q. Therefore, there's a close link between the Gospel of Thomas and Q. There are only 230, 225 verses in Q. But the Gospel of Thomas has taken, one thirty-five percent of all of the Gospel of Thomas happens to be Q. Now, some, very few, nothing, nothing, uh, one or two, no historical. What is Q? Why was it written? It's certainly one of the uh, scholars remarking about reading Q is that it's very clear that Q is not for Christians. By that he meant, obviously, that the traditional view of Christianity cannot be supported if you claim that's the traditional view of Christianity and you expect to find it in Q. It's not there, therefore they shouldn't have been Christians. Or it means you have to redefine what you mean by a Christian in terms of Q. There aren't any people in that sense. All we have is the Q. The Q, I don't get the force of your question. See, there aren't people. There's a document called, there's no formal gun. Okay, does Q cover then the miracles, passion, post-resurrection parables? Is that Look, what you were saying? No. Oh, it doesn't, okay. Post-resurrection. Okay, got it. No, right? 
parables too, right? Historical. Therefore, there's a close affinity, would you not agree, between Q and the Gospel of Thomas. And if these were the writings that were, were uh, being used to record what it was to be a Christian in these early ages, what kind of Christianity was it? Where does it go? What does it mean? Well, let me go one, one more step for you then. Kloppenberg did a brilliant analysis of it, and if you're going to look into Q, you should get that book, and I have a bibliography for you later. Uh, and he also brought together an unedited text of Q. I don't think we need this anymore. Now, let's make sure we see what Q is in terms of the four Gospels again, just to make sure, all right? Q is formally that material which is found, which is found in, Mar in Matthew and Luke, but not in Mark. Now, you can open up a text if you get the synopsis studies in the New Testament and you can just visually see what's Q, what's not Q. Because the synopsis then is the four Gospels are right there. And if there's material in each one that's run chronologically in terms of the development of the, of the story, then you can see very clearly that if there's a great big gap, here's Matthew, Here's Mark and here's Luke. If they have things to say and there's nothing for Mark, what do you call it? Q. And most of that material, except for a few uh, differences, is a material called Q or the sayings of Jesus. Now, there's something about the sayings of Jesus that is incompatible with Mark. Now, what is it? What is Q? Well, some very, very fine work has been done on Q. And I'd like to bring you up to date on a little bit of it. And let's see what we can do with it. Ah, there we are. All okay, right, now Q. And by the way, even though it's earlier in Matthew than in uh, and Luke, the reason for it, however, is that Luke is much... Uh, appears to have been have a keener grasp of Greek and the literary form of Greek, and therefore his expression of Q is far more literary correct than, than Matthew. But there's certain material in Matthew that is abbreviated that is not in Luke, but so enough of that. All right, Q, what is it? It appears to be in three levels, three distinct levels. The first appears to be wisdom literature. What do they mean by wisdom literature? There's a bunch of sayings of Jesus that can be identified that these statements can be shown to correspond to the wisdom tradition of the Hellenistic period. The sages, right, living at the time and that preceded Christianity. Now, if that's the case, you see, the first analysis of Q developed this thesis that Q is wisdom literature. If Q is wisdom literature, and it's common to a Hellenistic period, well then, how did Christianity then bring in these other elements, a post-resurrection hypothesis, the whole crucifixion or passion element, the whole development of Paul, and all of these ideas since you can't find these ideas in Q. Must have a different origin. The different origin may then be that the figure of Jesus bears a close relationship to the kind of wisdom traditions going on at the time, uh-oh, not from the Hebraic tradition, not from the Jewish tradition, but from the Greek tradition. Now, what does that mean? That's the shocker, because everyone for many, many years has wanted to show 
that Christianity could, could be seen to emerge from Judaism as a reform, as a revolt, as an eclectic, right? Uh, and these hypotheses can't be verified if you look at Q. Now, further analysis came along and they said, wait a minute, there's an element of Q you can separate which is prophetic. You can literally see it. Ah, next hypothesis. It appears that you can date this material, and this is early, and this is later. Well, then you might ask, what was going on at the time that could have generated this difference? Well, now comes in many interesting things. This means now that you can now ask what kind of people were living at the time? Is it possible to take the New Testament and locate all of the cities and the places in the New Testament where Jesus is said to have, been, is said to have gone? And see whether you can then get a map of his journeys. If you can, it's clear that he came out of and, and uh, brought his original teachings th into Galilee, out of Galilee. He returned to Galilee many times, as well as uh, Decapolis. What does that mean? Well, now we have the advantage of getting a nice new view of what Galilee was at the time. And this is the picture that emerges. Galilee was the city, actually it's a region, right? It's a region through which the great conquests passed. It was also a city that had an access to the sea through the roads, major roads. It was a hub of commerce. It was a very exciting place to live. It was only annexed by the Jews at 100 BC. Before that, it was not. And they fiercely opposed any annexation Therefore, the following picture emerges. They're not Jewish. They resented the Jewish domination. It was a city, including Tiberias, Galilee, Tiberias, Decapolis, that area, uh, the, by which is by the Sea of Galilee. These cities were Hellenistic. Hellenistic means they were designed Right. They were designed as Hellenistic cities, therefore they had theaters, gymnasiums, libraries, stoic, stoas. They had administrative offices. They had all of the elements that brought into existence the Hellenistic thought. Oh. That's where Jesus emerged from. That's a profound difference. How do we know that? It's only because of the recent, no more than the last 25 years, has archaeology and sociology have brought, the, brought their arts together to explore this region, region impartially. And this is what they're finding. That this was a rich cultural tradition. And uh, I have a, a map here that I'll make, kind of superimpose quickly for you. I hope I have a map here. I should have a map here. I don't want to use my memory. I will use my memory. Hmm. Oh, I know where it is. I just want to re reproduce just one thing. All right? The coast, right? Phoenicia, right? Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. Tiberius.
Now this is Galilee. This is Nazareth. Nazareth is in Galilee. Right? This is Tiberias. This is Gadara. Now one can walk from Nazareth to Gadara. Uh, that is not a long journey at all. One can walk that. Now Gadara happens to be at the time the center of philosophy, the center of literature. There are three major philosophers that lived at this time, at the time of Jesus. They had a rich literature they were developing. They were refurnishing and rethinking and reformulating the heroic myths. They had a very interesting society that was organized along what they call collegia. or associations. People got together to form brotherhoods and associations. They reworked the stories of Prometheus, Osiris, Adam, uh, Hercules, especially Hercules. That's the literature that was being produced in this area. And it had a vast influence on Tiberius. And out of this now, what's most interesting is that when we're talking about uh, this area, which runs like this, is collectively called Decapolis. That is the area of ten Greek cities. They were all founded by the Greeks. They had Greek designs. They had Greek associations. The center of the intellectual thought was Gadara. They influenced Tiberias. That's where they uh, carried out, and uh, they had a vast and interesting reformulation of Hellenistic culture. Now, as you consider that fact, what kinds of thinkers and philosophers, what were they doing there? They belong to what loosely can be called, now the, the names of these people right, as classes are cynic and stoic. Don't confuse it with cynical or stoicism. Right? It's a name given at that time for a very interesting reason. It's a name for a dog. What kinds of people were they? First cynics at that time. Uh, yes. Epicurus? Was Epicurean? Yes, Epicurean was also part of it. Yes. Uh, ah, here I am in this beautiful picture I wanted to share with you. At that time, the Cynic and the Stoics appeared as the figure of the sage. Now, what was the sage during this period of time? Long hair long beard, knapsack, a staff, no home, lived in temples for nights, days, spent time there. He had a particular interesting way of relating to people. He would be confrontational. He would challenge them. Their basic thesis was ethics. Ethics is the way in which you can get close to the nature of God. That was their basic thesis. They used a whole range of very interesting confrontive devices. They appear very much like us, a lot of the ancient uh, uh, Chinese sages, uh, Chinese Buddhists, some Japanese Buddhists, very similar. Now, the Stoic was much more intellectual than the Cynic. The only thing he adds to it is that he didn't appear nude in the rain like these sages did, by the way. And they had the reputation of being able to walk on uh, snow without uh, any, any uh, clothing or footwear. Uh, they lived very often on the edge of uh, society. They liked living in the desert. Stoic develops rationality, right? Seeks ra the rational, perfect happiness, the sage alone can know the gods in God. 
he goes for an inner transformation. Their view of God, can, their view of God was God can be can called the father, the ruler, a providential being, also fate and nature. The sum total, all of these are just different words for God. Now, what has this got to do with Q? The writings of Q bear a very close similarity to the writings of the Cynics, what we know of the Cynics and the religious figures in the Stoic tradition. Then what was going on in Galilee? These men stressed the natural life is the divine life, getting close to the natural life. They were called divine men. Many of them had whole theories about dream interpretation. They offered themselves up as oracles. Some were into astrology. Some functions as a, uh, physicians at many uh, uh, centers and temples. As we said before, they got together in fellowships. They developed in this period. What period are we talking about? We're talking about the 150 years BC to 100 AD. The ideas and the philosophers, they developed a literature. And what kind of thinking, therefore, did these people get involved in? Well, I have a couple of quotes for you. The goal is to make men aware of sin and to lead them to repentance. That's a quote. The goal of ethics is indispensable. It is fitting to eat and drink and sleep under the supervision of a worthy man. The whole idea of the worthy man in this system is that these men become models. They accept the role of becoming models. They are the ideal. They become the model for others. Do you want to be pleasing to God? Be good. To worship God is to imitate him. He requires no sacrifices, but a pious and upright will. The beneficent God is an inner God who bears witness to our acts. God the Father, God the Judge. It's a deep, deep-seated religious feeling through these people. It stems primarily from the recognition of a special relationship between man and God. If man is free, it's because he's one of the most important components in nature, because all other things are made to complement him. He's a work of God. He's a particle of God who gave him over to, to himself instead of allowing him to become dependent. I have some uh, more interesting quotes now. Now, I have copies of all of these quotes. I have Xeroxes for you when you're interested in them. What is nature but God and the divine reason that pervades the whole universe and all its parts? If you should call him fate, it would be no falsehood. For since fate is nothing but a connected chain of causes, he is the first of all causes on which all else depends. Any name that you choose will be properly applied to him if it connotes some force that operates in the domain of heaven. His titles are countless, as are his benefits. God is all that we see, even the wholeness of what we can see.
the key development is conscience. This should be summoned to give an account of itself every day. What have you done today? What have you resisted? In what respects are you better? You must be, appear before a judge every day, and that is conscience. I scan the whole of my day and retrace all my deeds and words. I conceal nothing from myself. I omit nothing. Why should I shrink from any of my mistakes when I commune with myself? There's nothing I do for the sake of opinion, everything for the sake of my conscience. Bad deeds are lashed by the whip of conscience. Every man, every, pardon me, hence every man who hide their sins can never count upon them remaining hidden for their conscience convicts them and reveals them to themselves. Everyone is in a state of sin. Those who say they have nothing, done nothing wrong, you say rather you admit nothing wrong. Some sins we have committed, some we've contemplated, some we've desired, some we've encouraged. And all of these we've sinned. Thesis on love is very interesting. The soul alone renders us noble. It may rise superior to fortune out of any earlier condition, no matter what condition it's been. How do you do that? Simply by distinguishing between good and bad things. Only one thing to do, one may leap to heaven from the very slums, only rise and mow yourself to kinship with God. Um. This, uh, I should mention their names, uh, but uh, I have them all copied for you. This is a commentary on Seneca. He's one of the Stoics. The precepts of, of Seneca appeal to have precise analogs in the Gospels, even if they're justified with different reasons. In particular, the precept of love and forgiveness. Especially fruitful is forgiveness towards those who offend you. To accept the offenses without hatred and not to be implacable against those who act evilly. To be on the contrary for these motives of good hope. It's proper to, to placid and cordial natures. How much better that the philosopher show such dispositions to maintain as worthy of forgiveness he who has offended him rather than believe in defending by appealing to the causes and to lawsuits and in reality to detract from himself. God is providence. He's the imminent mind. He's nature. He's fate. For what else is nature but God and the divine reason which pervades the whole universe and all of its parts? These are the uh, quotes that represent the kinds of thinking going on at that time. And are there kinships with Q? Yes. Therefore, 
This brings us to an interesting issue, you see. And that issue is ah. Christians who are going to follow this kind of reasoning and the implications of this kind of research and reflection are going to have to become involved in looking at this entire picture in a new way, bringing in together anthropology, sociology, Hellenistic thought. Now, the basic thesis of these people is that nature, providence, Faith, the ruler of all, the father, the all. These are different names for one God. Now, what is the difference between the Stoic and the Cynic? Now, if you take that in general, you'll come to certain conclusions. But if you go to each particular Stoic, you'll find that what we know about them is that they have all been very deeply influenced by Hellenistic thought. And Hellenistic thought at this time is going through a resurgence. Now, if you then try to go back into this period to make sense of Q, and you find a kinship with the Cynic and Stoic thinkers, would it be interesting to know on what basis these can be distinguished? If there is a rational way to distinguish them, including and separating from all of these things, God, if there is a way to separate all of those things from it, then you'll see that these people have been influenced by this kind of thought, but the distinctions necessary to see their differences is nothing other than Platonism. That's the difference between Stoicism and Platonism. Therefore, Stoicism takes the primary belief that ethics is a way to proceed, and it's through ethics that you can know God, and that's all that you need is an ethical view with a view that embraces this. It's not merely ethics and includes this theology. But since if any thinking Christian has gone through all of these steps and appreciates all of these distinctions, is it not likely that such thinking Christians then are going to explore cynic and stoic thought to find their origin? And once you do that, you're then into this realm and you're going to see how these ideas emerged, why they're brought together into a class, and why they didn't separate them. The reason they didn't separate them and why they're not Platonists is that they don't believe that reason can make these distinctions on a lasting and uh, rational basis. And that rational basis, even if you do so, will have any effect on you as a possible sage. That is to say, they don't believe that the dialectic and the exploration of human thought, if it does make these distinctions, will have any effect on you personally and your spiritual life. That's what separates the Stoics from the Platonists. That's why I think it's very likely then that people who are thinking Christians, who follow this kind of logic, will then come to explore these issues and they will then be brought to face with that, that curious question of whether or not the distinctions between these are meaningful and whether seeing those distinctions will in fact give you a deeper understanding of the spiritual life of man. Now, just to go back to what I was talking about before, I just want to point out that there are a number of primary thinkers that I'd like to tell you that I've drawn upon. John Locke, Albert Schweitzer, Grisbach, YC, especially two document theses, Lachman, Holtzman, Schmidt. Schmidt did that wonderful work about you can understand Mark in respect to the connections between the events, and that will show you that it's a literary work. Uh, Robinson is the chap over here in Claremont. 
and he's the one who's doing that great work on the, uh, with Dodds, with uh, the parables. He's also working on Q and the Gospel of Thomas. And Klopenberg, the great uh, major thinker in the study of Q, he's done two major works, and I invite you to go into that. Harnack, I've enjoyed. Boltman, as you know, I, I get involved in. So these are the primary thinkers uh, I've dealt with, and that's the background for the work that I've done this evening. So I've said enough. How about some questions? Thank you for your patience, by the way. And I thought I'd do that in exactly one hour, and I did. Um, you, you made a comment earlier that Luke was seen to be dependent upon Q. Q. And I wondered, and you, you gave a couple of yes, reasons. Yes, and I yes, yes. That is a thesis. That's not my thesis. Oh. That is a thesis which, you, which I'm, I'm interested in. Uh, um, if it goes this way, if they are two, if they are two or three levels, and if those levels are preserved in an order in which Luke explores Q, then he's dependent upon Q. Oh, gotcha. That's that's the way. Sure, that's yeah. Right. yeah. The third level is where they talk about a combination, and to me it's not clear at all, which is why I haven't talked about Q3. Are you, are you trying to make a case for Q having been a platonic coming out of this? The major work on Q is Mack. One of the, there, Kloppenberg is the, is the formally scholarly edition, and that's re really a very beautiful edition. But a great deal uh, you can get from Max, the Lost Gospel Q, very fine study. Then the, these are the sayings of Jesus. But it sounds like they are the sayings of the cynics and the stoics. That's the thesis. Okay. That is to say, you can find, uh, See, a lot of the, the, some of the basic ideas that emerge in Mark already pre, like uh, uh, baptism with the repentance for the forgiveness of sins, that is not an exclusive Christian teaching. John had it before Jesus appeared. And it also appears in the Stoic writings. And you can find that same quote, as a matter of fact, in their writings. So, uh, Yes, you can find many of the uh, quotes from Q. You can mine them up. And that's the work they're doing right now. That's the work they're doing right now. So, so did Jesus have a uh, sin? Well, this thesis would say, uh, see, I'm glad you mentioned that. Why did the prophetic material emerge? If you take a look at the history of this area, Decapolis as well as Galilee, it went through a massive change politically. And it appeared, therefore, that this was going to be a period when their whole culture was being questioned severely, and they thought the end was coming. Therefore, it became prophetic after a point. Therefore, on that basis, they can say that there was a shift. There was a shift in, the, in this kind of thinking during that social crisis that occurred, and that produced the prophetic level called Q2. And it's going to be uh, dated pretty well now. So the, the Old Testament is called the laws, right? The Old Testament? Is that true? Was what? The Old Testament, was that a, a book of ethical laws? Yeah, you see the difference between these ethical, these ethical laws have nothing to do with being revealed by someone. This is close to what they call the natural man. It doesn't gain its authority by being true because it was revealed. This is one that's saying, look here, we are rational beings. You, you have a conscience. You have to find your conscience. You have to act it. So it's a, uh, it's a, it has this theology, but it's rooted in what is called the natural man. And those quotes from Q don't appear to have an origin in a revealed source. And they appear to be radically different from the Jewish wisdom tradition. So this brings about a. Uh, oh, so the Old Testament then really has nothing to do with the sinners and stories. It's part of the Hebrew culture then. That's right. See, 
see, for so long we've wanted to say that Christianity emerged as a reform or as a revolution out of Judaism, or it wanted to make it as a separate movement. And uh, each one of these theories can be examined in terms of Q. And it's done, people have done it, and it's very good. And you can see that under that assumption, you can't find any evidence to support that from Q. I, for some reason, I don't have among the many, many uh, friends, Catholic scholars. I would like to, but uh, since 1943, you see, actually, scholarship among Catholics has turned about. And since 1943, they were allowed by the Pope to enter into biblical studies, studies and borrow the research techniques and methodologies of Protestant theologians. And they have been doing new work since then, and that's 50 years now. You see, there are so many similarities between Seneca and St. Paul. Is that right? Oh, yeah, okay. that it's amazing. But the difference is critical. And the difference is rest upon that one question. And that is you can't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps or by your own efforts. You need the will of God. And you need an appeal to faith. And unless you do that, whatever efforts you make are, are fruitless. Yeah, 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 yeah. But theoretically, you can find nearly uh, the great bulk of the thought between Paul and Seneca. Some people have made that study, by the way, and it's worth worth going into. Yeah. Uh, I, I did some, some work with, uh, in, a, in a text once that looked like Jesus wanted to identify himself as um, the, the coming as the Messiah. Right? He makes some looked like he was cracked, like sculpting himself as uh, a messianic kind of figure, doing the kinds of things that would lead him to, uh, to be identified as that person that was foretold in the Old Testament. And yet what we're looking at here, it looks like he, he was acting, if, if what you're saying is true, if he's acting the part of a uh, cynic sage or something along that line. Oh. What this, what I'm saying this evening, is that if you follow the line of research, you can only explore Q the way we're doing if you're willing to ignore all of the other accounts and first get into Q and look at Q first primarily and see what has happened as an example. All right? If Q is giving this formal confrontive approach, which is typical of the cynic, demanding immediate response on an ethical level from everyone, and it's all open, exoteric, then could Mark incorporate it if he's considering that there must be an esoteric right. tradition of the 12 and those about him? Mm -hmm. that, therefore, there wouldn't be any need for it. Therefore, he doesn't include it. So that picture might emerge from Mark and not from... Well, no, you, you can get it probably, yeah. Well, yes, you... you uh, Rather than from. Yeah. I guess I want to know if you knew where that fell in terms of is it the sayings of Jesus or is it? No, that's Matthew. You can get it in Matthew very clearly. You can get it in parts of Luke. See, this redefines, you have to redefine like the Pharisees. The whole idea of the Pharisees, which play a major role in the, in the Gospels. It's interesting that in this area, by the way, there were no kings, no temples. Uh, that, that's right, that's right. They were, for as a group of people, without an official priestcraft, at least a hierarchy of priestcraft, in this entire area of Galilee. Now, that's very significant. Yes. Because that means then someone with this kind of a background could function ideally through that culture. Now, what happens when you take that and move it into the Jewish tradition? Now, see, they're taking on the role. They want to be the role. They're willing to be the model. They are carrying the role. They want to be the model. They're encouraging other people to follow them as they themselves are willing to be the model. That's what they're doing. That's the role of the sage. 
So would that fit within the but Jewish? Then, then if you take that idea and put it in the idea of Messiah as someone who is going to play the role of a possible political figure or a spiritual figure with either way you want to go, then it takes on a Jewish tradition and meaning. But wait a minute, is that consistent with Q? No. What does that do? Looks like it was someone's axe to grind, so to speak. That's see, one should do it. See, depending upon how you view something, that particular vantage point you secure for yourself in that vision, so you see the things you see. But if you take it chronologically, if you move it from Q going this way, then you can see all the differences and you can speculate now upon why the differences exist. We could go back on our table, couldn't we? We could go back on our table. We could say, well, and with Thomas, that's the great shop which we haven't, we haven't done. But there's a very nice relationship between this kind of thinking, cynic and stoic, and, and uh, the Gospel of Thomas especially in the way in which he uses words because one of the key functions of the sage as a cynic or stoic is to use words to confront one another most directly. Right. And therefore, uh, it, it's a different, it's, a, it's, it's not a Messiah message. It's not a, it certainly can't be looked upon as a Messiah in the Hebraic sense. Do you have some favorite Q passages? You're not going to find look, you're not you're not going to find faith in the idea of uh, either in the Gospel of Mark or in Q. Do you have any favorite? Q? Oh, I thought you said faith. Excuse me. <laughs> Do you have any favorite? See, that's what happens. Favorite Q quotes, or do you? Do you oh know, do you yeah. Think it's a sampling or representation yeah, yeah, of those yeah. thoughts. Someone approaches Jesus and says. Uh, um, um, a lot of Native Americans have worked with dreams too, and uh, yeah. they also seem to be very much uh, uh, let's say, uh, naturistic. Or, uh, they, they put a great deal of primacy in the laws of nature. Being oh, yes, and very, yes, yes. So, could you, could you yes. Speak from that? Oh, yeah, yeah, there are, there are quite a few uh, parallels. Yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 that's the case. Was the distinction between a stoic and a cynic a person who would apply platonic methods to break apart those concepts? Would that be, is, that, is that the stoic or the um, It's really, uh, I think it's an it's a interesting difference that the cynic is not even interested in writing down his thoughts. He's not interested in demonstrating any scholarship. He wants to speak directly from a tradition, and he's going to mold it and express it as an extreme ethical position. And he's going to say that culture and all of the forms it takes are not significant. The only significant thing is to transform yourself and do it right now. The Stoic then is saying the same thing, but he's going to have recourse to a, tho to a theology now, the other significant difference between a Platonist and a Stoic is that um, a, metaphysics, a metaphysics presupposes a view of physics. They go together. You have a cosmology and you have a metaphysics. And you can explore the development of that dialectically by making all of the classes of distinctions, especially between these terms. Since the Stoics are not interested in making these distinctions and they think they're worthless, they neither, they neither have a cosmology nor do they necessarily have a physics. They don't have a physics. They, what they tend to have as a view of physics is actually very similar to, if you're familiar with them, um, uh, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes. Representational. Um, yeah. But getting back to the idea of um, of the sage and whether or not uh, Jesus set himself up as a sage, or the argument that he set himself up as a sage or as a messiah, there's a great difference between a sage and a messiah. Yeah. I don't think they're entirely uh, comparable if you study uh, hard enough and 
what have you, you may become a sage. That in no way means that you will be a messiah. That is sort of a special class. Yeah. So would a That's messiah right. feel the need to even advertise himself or herself, depending upon with you yeah. as such? A sage, yes. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a model, follow me, mm -hmm. think my thoughts, live the way I live. Not a messiah. Well, let's say if you go to John, it's uh, Gospel of John, is, it has that element. I mean, you don't, you just be, you don't announce or no, advertise. No, not both. No, it's in John, depending on which Gospel. It's clearly in John, you have it. Um, here, let me, let me, um, um, Well, I prefer to. Uh, I was going to go off my head and uh, here, here's one. Someone said to him, "I will follow you wherever you go." Jesus answered, "Foxes have dens, birds the sky." Birds of the sky have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Um, I have a real fun one. And I marked it up. But, uh, Don't follow me home anyway. That's what that all right. Someone says to him, say, is the kingdom of heaven profound? He said, if you think it's profound, the fish will get there before you. Profound, deep. Oh, you think the kingdom of heaven is lofty? Well, the birds will get there before you. <laughs> that kind of, <laughs> that kind of direction, you know. What? <laughs> Very typical. That kind of direction, and that 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 fun kind of <clears throat> of challenging people's. Uh, it's Dharma combat. It's a very, very rich, very rich, very beautiful. Um, John heard about this. This is a, I'm going to the end of it. And sent his disciples to ask, are you the one to come or should we look for another? Jesus said, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind recover their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear, dead are raised. And the poor are given good news. And the truly fortunate ones are the ones who are not disturbed at hearing about me. You don't have to Everyone who hears my words and does not do them is like a man who built a house on sand. The rain came, the torrent broke against it, and it collapsed. Hey, can the uh, blind lead the blind? Wouldn't they both fall into a pit? Response. A student's not better than his teacher. It's enough for a student to be like his teacher. That's all. Um, nothing is hidden that will not be made known. Nothing secret that won't come to light. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. What you hear in a whisper, proclaim in the housetops. Don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. Can't kill the soul. Can't you buy five sparrows for two cents? But not one of them will fall to the ground without God knowing about it. Even the hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. What is the kingdom of God like? Uh, to what should I compare it? It's like a grain of mustard, which a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds in the air made nests in its branches. 
The kingdom of God is like yeast, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it leavened the whole mass. Everyone who glorifies himself will be humiliated. And the one who humbles himself will be praised. Good, good, good stuff. Yeah, I, I find it you know, very refreshing in that real high sense. And the analysis is good, and he breaks it up into uh, these pieces. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, Well, he's got quite a bit also on uh, Seneca, but I'll hold that up. All right, but I want to just read one section here. If we ask about the character of the speaker of this kind of material, Q, it has its nearest analogy in contemporary profiles of the Cynic Sage. And this is as close to the historical Jesus as Q allows us to get, but it's close enough for us to reconstruct the beginning of the movement that is both plausible and understandable. One should not underestimate the attraction of a cynic-like sage capable of enticing individuals into forming a discursive association, a collegia, a society. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you very much. Hold it. You know, well, you know something funny that just occurred? Maybe there's a, a holdout of this in the Gospel of Mark in two places. One is where the woman comes up and touches, mm -hmm. and Jesus says, well, am I supposed to throw away children's food, give it to the dogs? Maybe it's a pun. Well, that's, that's interesting because that's one of the places in Mark where someone one-ups Jesus. Mm -hmm. Because she says, you know, uh, uh, you know, don't even throw crumbs to the dogs. He says, hey, you're close. Yeah. He, he recognizes that, compliments her, and says, yes, he will help. Yeah. And the other is when the scribe comes and gives him one up on him. When they talk about how close she, when Jesus concludes that the scribe is close to the kingdom of God, when they talk about the first commandment, because uh, the scribe responds to what Jesus says and says, uh, yes, you're right, but he adds an understanding. Because in Mark, the theme of understanding plays itself out as the dominant theme in Mark rather than belief. Understand, 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 understand. Yeah. He demands understanding to the, the uh, he, he demands understanding. Jesus demands understanding. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a quote. If you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a place where he ties together three chapters that he's carefully developed. Uh, chapter 8. Okay, yeah, thank you. 14 is right. See, before there was a discussion on the Pharisees and Herod and the two uh, uh, feeding of the 4,000 and the 5,000 and the travel across the waters where the disciples forgot their lunch and asked for Jesus for some bread. And take heed. Take heed, beware of the leaven, that was picked up, that's a major theme in Q, the leaven. Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they discussed it, discussed this with one another. We have no bread. 
And being aware of that, Jesus said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets full of broken pieces uh, did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. He said to them, don't you understand? Don't you understand yet? He keeps repeating. Do you, don't you understand? Don't you understand? It's not a belief game. It's, it's understand, understand, understand. It plays itself out. You're not understanding what I'm doing. So that's a... That's really fine. Thank you very much. Thank you.